I'm Larry Menti. Welcome to another thing. Recently, our area was pounded with a storm named Jonas. Snow up to three feet high, flooding, high winds were just some of the symptoms of the storm, depending on where you lived. The meteorologists did a pretty good job with Jonas, and yet, in recent history, they have monumentally blown some big forecasts. So who do we trust? And how do we separate the truth from the TV hype? Weather is our topic today, and we start with Ellen Kaloje. Ellen. Thank you, Larry. Well, it's been a wild winter so far. Some of us had our air conditioners on at Christmas time, and then just a few weeks later, Philadelphia got hit with its fourth largest snowstorm ever. And we got a lot more snow than even the forecasters predicted. So what's going on? Well, we came here to the National Weather Service to find out. 20 years ago, uh, people would be surprised uh, if we were forecasting an event a week ahead of time when we were right. Now it's happening. People are expecting the forecast to be halfway decent, and so now they're surprised if we're wrong. Joe McKetta has been a meteorologist for 35 years. He says during the last big storm, most people forget that forecasters always said we'd see more than a foot of snow. But at the last minute, the storm changed, and some places got double that. In the end, when you have to plow, does it really make a difference whether you're plowing a foot and a half or two feet or even three feet? You still got to get the plow, you still got to get the shovel out. Uh, but we'd like to be as accurate as we possibly can, and so um, uh, the amounts had to be uh, increased as we were going through the event, as we saw what was happening. Her chance this winter has come to an end. The good old groundhog saw his shadow, which means an early spring. Joe Maqueda agrees with Phil that we'll see temperatures higher than usual for the rest of winter, but we aren't out of the woods just yet when it comes to snow. But it, it is February. February is our snowiest month, so I tell people that uh, you know you can't. Uh, we can't get away. We are in the northern latitude, so we, we do get snow. So that's the problem. And I don't like snow, so I don't like saying that. But uh, but uh, February and February is uh, historically our snowiest month. So even though a lot of people like to joke about them being wrong, a group called the Weather Watchdog says the big guns like the National Weather Service and the Weather Channel and AccuWeather all get the forecast right about 82% of the time. Reporting for another thing, I'm Ellen Kaloje. All right, thank you, Ellen. Now to talk more about weather and forecasting and climate is Sean Sublett, meteorologist at Climate Central. It's a nonprofit that studies the climate, and I should say that you you advocate for no sides. Absolutely not. It's all based on science. Yeah, we're a science and communications organization committed to getting the science of climate change communicated to the public. Let's let's get to climate change in a second but let's start with weather forecasting How, is it pretty good it's a lot better than it used to be there's no question about that it's quite strong there are always going to be these levels where you can improve uh, but it is so much better than just 20 years ago they seem to nail jonas but they've had some huge mistakes we all remember last year the storm that missed the east coast that was supposed to slam into new york city and we all remember the storm of the century back uh, in the early 2000s that never which, hit which century ever that one it is, hit yeah. in boston i guess right it, yeah i think that was the one where i know they expected a lot more snow in washington and it ended up just dumping all over boston and like the one that we had last year they did get snow in new york it just wasn't quite the phenomenal amount of snow uh, that was the initial forecast so it's never going to be a perfect science. No, it's not. I mean, one of the ways we forecast nowadays is through computer simulations or what you oftentimes will hear is modeling. And you cannot perfectly represent the atmosphere mathematically because you can't have a data point in every single square inch of the atmosphere. The physics, the differential equations in these mathematical models are pretty good but we have computational limitations, we have sampling limitations uh, to find out what's going on in the atmosphere in the present. So anytime you can't perfectly represent the entire state of the atmosphere in the present, as you do that, that forecast forward, there are gonna be limitations or what we like to call round off error. Small mistakes will get magnified going forward into time as the forecast process continues. And you, in, in for New Jersey and New York and Philadelphia, you have the Philadelphia market, you have the New York market. Correct. The Philadelphia market and the New York market, like, let's take Philadelphia for a second, and New York, they have the Jersey Shore, Correct. they have the Poconos, they have the Lehigh Valley, they have Delaware, a and then you also have the, um, you know, the mountain ranges, uh, just northwest of New York, and you have Long Island. 
cli different climates for yeah. all those places, Precisely. and you're forecasting one forecast. You know, when you've got you know the Delaware and the Upper Chesapeake Bays that are also nearby, so you've got the mountainous effects, you've got the bay effects, you've got the ocean effects, you've got tidal effects, you've got all those things working, and you've got different levels of temperature at different heights in the atmosphere. Uh, you have winds in different directions. That's whole whole reason you have ice in the first place is because sometimes the temperature is above freezing two, four thousand feet above the ground, while the temperature close to the ground is below freezing. And Making the forecaster's job almost impossible on TV in these markets. It is a challenge when you have to consider the large area that you do serve and the limited amount of and the limited amount of time you have to serve those populations because they're watching in very different geographical areas. So yeah, the idea that one forecast is going to suit everybody over 20 odd counties is a fallacy. I know it's all meteorologists now. That's the that's the new thing. You can't just have a broadcaster. You have to have a broadcast meteorologist and a weather Department. Everybody's doing that now, and it's probably a good thing. However, they all want to put their own little spin on the forecast. And I just read some research recently that the National Weather Service still has the best forecast. So why not just repeat what they say? Well, again, that goes back to the communications issue. I mean, are you going to sit there and, and read all the National Weather Service forecasts off because for each county in the market? Because that's going to take you 10 or 15 minutes to read all that off. And plus, there's a question of how is that going to impact people? I mean, the straight forecast coming from the National Weather Service isn't going to tell you a lot about impacts. It isn't going to tell you, well, we think the Blue Ridge is going to be ice covered first thing in the morning. It's not going to tell you that. And that's why you need a communications professional who is also a meteorologist who understands the market, who understands the geography of the market, who understands the sociology yeah, of the market. You know what I'm saying? They change the forecast. They want to put Some do and some don't. Now, most of the time, the forecasts are normally so good because they're all pulling generally from the same suite of data, you know, the same numerical guidance or, or models, all right? And there's always going to be a small difference of opinion on, on a forecast. Sometimes all the data points in a very obvious direction. Sometimes the data doesn't point in an obvious direction. Sometimes everybody can look at it and go, yeah, it's sunny in 55, the end. But there are other times there's just too many variables. Like, well, if this little thing happens here and this little thing happens here three or four hours earlier, now we've got ice instead of five inches of snow. I want to ask one last question sure. before we I'll move on to climate, as I promised, yeah. and then we'll have you back to talk more about, about climate. But we're talking about weather forecasting today. How reliable, because I know most meteorologists hate these, how reliable are the 10-day forecasts? The 10-day forecasts, I would not put a lot of stock in. I mean, I wouldn't. I mean, certain parameters are well forecast six, eight days in advance, like the general temperature. But in terms of how much rain or snow you're going to get eight, nine, ten days out, I just wouldn't put a lot of stock in that. I've had people say, don't hold me to 10 days, don't hold me to five days, hold me to 48 or 24 hours. Yeah, and again, it depends on what part of the forecast you're most interested in. Do you care more about the temperature? Do you care more about the precipitation? Do you, I mean, those are things people are mostly interested in. Like we know this weekend is going to be milder than it has been in some time, probably in the 50s both days. A lot of value in that, and it's probably going to be dry. Can I tell you that it's going to be perfectly sunny? No, but I don't think you're going to have to worry a lot about rain this weekend. It's probably going to be in the 50s both days, so it ought to be pretty nice. And I should point out that many meteorologists don't like this, but it's done because viewers like it, and they want that 10-day, and then it gets to be competitive after a while. So let me let me move on because we're sure. running out of time, uh, and we'll, we'll make this a tease for your next appearance right, right. when you come back. Uh, your organization, as you said, preaches the science of climate change and tries to get broadcast professionals to be more interested in it in their forecasts. Um, just quickly, as we talk about the Jersey Shore, let's keep it local, Jersey Shore or Long Island or the, or the Chesapeake Bay, what, are, what do you see, and again, it's purely science, as the effects, the long-range effects on this area? Well, the biggest effect is going to be a long-term sea level rise. There's been approximately eight inches of sea level rise over the last century along the Jersey Shore. That means the incidence of kind of nuisance or regular coastal flooding are going to be worse as we go forward in time. In fact, given how much warming we've already kind of baked into the system, we expect that there's probably going to be about six feet of sea level rise. Again, not next week, not next year. It might take a century or two. Uh, but the planet is going to warm so much that we do expect ice to melt at the poles, and that is going to dump into the sea, and there's going to be thermal expansion. In other words, water expands as it warms and about six feet of sea level rise expected in the Jersey Shore 
in several decades to centuries. And you're absolutely confident in this, without a doubt. There's the very is. high confidence. And to sit there and go, absolutely, without a doubt, that it, put your foot down, that's always dangerous. There's always a little bit of uncertainty. All right, but uncertainty doesn't mean you don't know anything. It just means you don't have every single detail worked out yet. Six feet's a good ballpark estimate, maybe four, maybe 10, all right? But it's unquestionable that the seas are going to be coming up. The, question the politics is, of this must frustrate you. It, uh, it's not my favorite thing to discuss, no. <laughs> but no. let's do that next time when that you sounds, come back. Thank you very thank much, you. You've been great. Appreciate I, it. I really appreciate it. Sean Sublett, who will be back, meteorologist at Climate Central. Uh, they study, they're a nonprofit that studies climate change, and they'll be back to talk about that. Sean will be back to talk about that very soon. When we come back, we talked about the weather forecast. Now the people that have to react and keep you safe once they get that forecast and inclement weather is on the way. We'll talk more about that about weather preparations when we come back on another thing.